Eric, our guest tonight, and his partner, Li Jin Yun, they're the principals of Howling Yun Architecture based in Boston. Their work is probing and innovative, but clearly built upon the fundamentals of the discipline. They're not about chasing trends. They're single-minded in their focus on architecture, but expansive in their methodologies and approaches, resulting in a body of work that interestingly embraces different protagonists. From tectonics, like the hotel in Chengdu, to site, like downtown Crossing Plaza, to structure, the Collier Memorial, to ecology, like the float lab at Schuylkill River, and materiality, like sky courts. Eric and Nietzsche's practice straddles the professional and academic, and academic realms. Eric is an associate professor at Harvard University, while Nietzsche is the new dean at Cornell University School of Architecture. <coughs> The rigorous approach to design suggests research practicing, I'm sorry, research practice and practicing research are one and the same, which is easier said than done. They have received numerous awards for their architecture projects, for their research work, and also as educators. The work of Howler Yoon do not rely on a single image. It's rich in layers, rich in scales, rich in experience, and rich in perception. In many ways, I think this narrow yet deep approach goes hand in hand with our lecture series named Making Architecture. It takes single-minded commitment to make architecture. It takes a nerd. So please help me in welcoming Eric Haller. <laughs> hey, wow. Thanks, Clover. Um, we also use the word nerd. We like to use the word nerd. We talk about our own, our own um, projects as nerding out. Sometimes we nerd out on tectonics, or we nerd out on, uh, on diagrams, or on, uh, on concepts. So I'll, I'll take it. I'll embrace the nerd. Thank you. Um, tonight's talk I called Signal to Noise, which um, is a term that we borrowed from communication theory. So uh, what does it mean for us as architects to think about signal and noise? For us, it's kind of a, um, well, technically, signal to noise is the ratio of uh, how much of a communication of a broadcast is interpretable or legible uh, to the receiver, so the sender and the receiver. Um, noise, we take to be the kind of ambient sort of amount of communication out there, and signal is the part that sort of gets through, that's legible. And for us, the question of signal to noise is something that we've sort of attached to a kind of understanding of contemporary culture. So. We're also working on a book called Signal to Noise uh, that's hopefully forthcoming soon. Um, the question of communication has to do with broadcast, and our premise is that architecture is a kind of broadcast. It's a kind of low definition broadcast. And for us, that helps us think about not just the work that we do, but also its reception. What's, who's the audience for this work? Who's receiving this work? How much is getting through? Uh, and can they really sort of decode uh, the, the, the concepts within a kind of cultural backdrop of uh, kind of superabundance of information. So our hunch is that there's something going on in culture, uh, that we're all sort of obsessed with, with signals, we're all obsessed with communication, we're all obsessed with messaging, uh, and you get conditions like this, where we can't see the, the kind of master work because we're all sort of focused on our, on our Instagram feeds or our own uh, social networks. Um, but looking back at architecture, maybe, we could say that architecture as a form of broadcast maybe achieved a kind of certain moment uh, where all of architecture was in the service of one thing. So Gothic architecture, for one, uh, could be understood as a special effects uh, machine, something that's everything from the structure to the coloration of the glass uh, to the dematerialization of the skin. This is all about creating a particular effect. And this effect is, is a persuasive effect. When you enter the church, you're inspired. You're, you're, uh, you're being persuaded to believe something and all of this architecture is about uh, reinforcing this particular effect this kind of broadcast this kind of signal um, thinking about modernity uh, and the kind of transformation of the city the traditional city uh, through the boulevard uh, it produced new kinds of subjects so if you think about uh, sort of Paris uh, at, you know the 18th century or beginning of the 19th century um, the new Boulevards changed the way people interacted on the street, uh, and it introduced new subjects. Uh, we like to think of the social codes that sort of architecture produces, uh, what you can do, what you can't do, uh, and the new behaviors that it produced, like window shopping. So if you're 
strolling down the boulevard in Paris after these new boulevards have been carved. Maybe you're, you're interested in this kind of new social practices of strolling, of, of window shopping, of uh, observing each other. And so for the German philosopher Walter Benjamin, uh, the idea of strolling in the Parisian arcade uh, was a new kind of social practice. Uh, and for Benjamin, he identified a new, a new user. Maybe the, the flaneur would be the person who sort of wandered the streets uh, and sort of was sort of uh, drunk with uh, the kind of pleasure of the new, of the new city. Um, Benjamin talks about architecture being different from art because it's experienced in a state of distraction. Um, unlike art, which is framed by the gallery, framed by the frame of the painting, uh, architecture is always sort of surrounded by um, other buildings uh, and other signals. And so I try to imagine Benjamin's flaneur in Times Square and what that experience would be if he was already overwhelmed uh, in Paris, uh, you know, 1932, how would he behave in Times Square? Or for that matter, how would he behave uh, in, in Hong Kong? Uh, think about the kind of superabundance of signals uh, and messages that you see on any street in Hong Kong. Uh, and how you might, you know, what would Benjamin's flaneur have to say to, to Nathan Road? Uh, and the kind of superabundance of, of signs and signals and architecture sort of being lost within this sort of uh, broadcast uh, landscape. The first time I came to Hong Kong, I saw the movie Blade Runner, and I thought that there was a kind of collapse between what was inside on the TV and outside uh, in the city. And to some extent, I think, you know, Hong Kong was kind of an inspiration for uh, this image of a future. And William Gibson says that the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And so I think about Hong Kong and sort of being already in this future, this is the original Blade Runner, and the, uh, the remake uh, also sort of takes the idea of the billboard, the sign, and it sort of literally leaps off the screen and becomes spatial, it becomes atmospheric, it becomes something that's uh, a complete environment. Uh, when we think about contemporary architecture, we think about the surfaces of architecture as, as, as a kind of broadcast medium, as a kind of display surface, uh, and we think about interfaces, and so the screen outside versus the screen against our our face, um, the, the kind of display that we has become our kind of standard workstation, and so as architects, we start to think about architecture not just as a kind of spatial definition or material distribution, um, but also starting to think about architecture as potentially uh, reclaiming the status of a kind of broadcast medium. Uh, and how do we think about media and material together? I noticed the taxi driver this morning had all these different displays, and so could architecture sort of participate in this? This question of interface, this question of display. Um, maybe this is typical here. I was uh, impressed. I don't know what he's looking at. Is he looking at the road? Is he checking his uh, stock? I don't know. Um, but this question of, of architecture as surface, as information surface, thinking about the, um, the idea that every surface could become a kind of messaging surface. And these are early projects that we did looking at um, communicating through surfaces, through uh, computer control LEDs. Fast forward a little bit to from Benjamin Paris to the American city and the idea that a skyscraper has a kind of broadcast uh, message, it incorporates the sort of signage, it incorporates the brand, and in a way the company or the bank starts to uh, collapse the architecture or the sign. Um, and now we see this, uh, this is New York, obviously Empire State Building, uh, and fast forward, every building becomes a kind of signal. Every building is communicating through color, uh, through graphics, through imagery. Uh, so what does this mean for architecture? Does it mean that architecture is, uh, again, becoming this sort of, uh, this medium, uh, this mass medium uh, for communication? We also look at the public realm, how people behave in the public realm, and it seems to me that the status of the public realm has changed dramatically. We no longer walk uh, down the street and sort of look at each other. We're always looking at our phones or else this is an image when the Pope was inaugurated. Everybody's sort of capturing the moment. Nobody saw the Pope. They all just sort of photographed the Pope. Um, and so how do we think about behavior in the public realm? How do we think about what's, what can happen in public that doesn't happen inside, between private and public? Uh, and there is something about a kind of chance encounter, the kind of serendipitous moment of walking down the street, or the spontaneous gathering, this idea that architecture and the city or a platform for these kinds of social social events, these, uh, maybe for entertainment, uh, but also other kinds of behaviors, recreation, uh, escape, uh, protest, 
Uh, and the idea that the public realm is a charged space. It's a space of, uh, of producing identity, of articulating a, a kind of political stance. Uh, yet, how does the public realm change when we all are networked, when we all have a, a device in our pocket? And so, since the beginning of our practice, we've been thinking about how does architecture and technology become enhanced by these technologies? How does it become more responsive, uh, more intelligent? Uh, so one of our first projects, this is a project done by my wife, Mi Jin Yoon, when she started teaching at MIT in 2001. Uh, she designed uh, the defensible dress. Um, and this dress is a combination of microcontrollers, um, proximity sensors, um, and shape memory alloys. And so when you come too close, um, the microcontroller tells uh, the electric charge to uh, to runs a charge through the shape memory alloy and contracts, and that sort of raises the, the quills. So in 2001, she was thinking about architecture as uh, a technology, as a definition of a personal space. And so people said, is this fashion? And we said, no, this is architecture, because it's spatial, because it's cultural. It's defining a kind of personal limit uh, to what we expect private and public space to be. In 2004, we did our first sort of installation for the Athens Olympics. Uh, at the base of the Acropolis, we created a, a kind of field of lights. And the concept was, uh, when you walk through the field of lights, <coughs> they would respond to you. And so we made these, uh, I think there are 440 uh, individual fiber optic stocks uh, with a microcontroller and a light. So the same technology as the dress. Um, and this is a very low res video from 2004. Uh, but you see the field of lights there? People are sort of walking through the field, and as they walk through, the lights light up brighter, and they emit a white noise. And so the white noise and the white light sort of creates a kind of atmosphere, something immersive, something that uh, masks the sound of the city. And so with no material, except sort of translucent fiber optics, uh, we created a space in the city, a space that sort of uh, masked the surrounding context. Uh, and so this was, in a way, an architecture uh, of a kind of personal space, an architecture of, of traces um, and responses uh, that provoked a series of behaviors. And so people would go in here and they would sort of um, try to figure it out. And they, they would sort of refuse to leave. And so we imagine that people would move through, but they just sort of stayed in there. And so for us, the lesson was, how do you design a public space using technology, anticipating people's behaviors? And so as architects, we focus on buildings but we don't focus on behavior. And for us, working in the public realm with these technologies, we realize that what we're really building is a set of behaviors and responses that people have in these spaces. Uh, so this is the very basic uh, construction of this uh, one uh, unit uh, that produced this field of, of fiber optics. So since 2004, we've been working on a series of projects. A couple of years ago, we did a project uh, for the US government on the US-Mexico border. Uh, this is uh, a typical sort of border crossing uh, between U.S. and Mexico. There's 26 lanes, uh, and apparently it takes six hours to cross uh, sometimes, right? So we just went to Shenzhen today, it was much faster. But here you could wait six hours in a car. Um, the, the GSA, the General Services Administration, asked us to do a, a public art piece. Um, and we said maybe the idea would be that <clears throat> when you're waiting in traffic, you want to know, is anything happening? Is anyone going through? And so the concept was, every time a car goes through, we kind of create a burst of light. And so we're basically saying, uh, we're visualizing the passage and the flow of traffic through this border. The border which seems impervious, um, we can create this sort of um, expression or the articulation of movement, of flow. Uh, so this was the installation. It's one pixel by 500 feet. It spans 26 lanes. Uh, and every time a car goes through, we sort of create this sort of broadcast. And it's a super simple project as an art project. Uh, but now that Trump's president, and he talks about border walls, and he talks about you know, fear of people that cross the border, the idea the border could be permeable, uh, permeable or pervious, uh, seems kind of become a kind of new neurosis. And this idea that we can sort of broadcast this fluidity, this passage, this permeability, uh, seems somehow important. Because people live their lives on both sides of the border. And it's not just this kind of wall. A wall is not going to solve our problems, uh, and the kind of um, the kind of uh, xenophobia and the neurosis that comes with this idea of the border. Uh, I think this little project somehow tries to undo that that sort of uh, that neurotic uh, insistence on the wall. So 
the book that we're working on has a few chapters. The first one is about signal and noise and about architecture communicating. The next chapter we talk about means and methods. And this is where we sort of say, well, how do we make architecture? How do we think about tectonics? Um, a few years ago, maybe eight, uh, we were invited actually by Doreen Liu, who's a professor here. And she was working on a, on a parcel. Uh, I think her parcel was C. Uh, they asked us to do parcel G. And this is a project in Chengdu. Um, we were a little bit in disbelief because we had never worked in Chengdu. We didn't know uh, this client. Uh, they said, we'd like you to do this building. It's going to be a clubhouse, a kind of live work space. Uh, and we'd like it to have a Chinese courtyard organization. Um, and the other rule was it had to have a sloped roof. Uh, so those two rules were the preconditions. We said, OK, um, we can do that. Um, so we designed, we looked at sort of traditional uh, gardens. We noted that these buildings were more field than figure, but they were definitely figural buildings. And so the idea of a kind of bounded space that is sort of containing the garden, and the garden is a kind of macrocosm, how does architecture sort of define the edges of that, but also occupy that? Um, we took this section and we sort of interpreted it as, as one might, as a kind of ambitious uh, young architect. Uh, we produced this scheme and we said, yeah, it's got a sloped roof uh, and it's a courtyard house. Um, we, we thought we were complying. We thought we were quite clever. Um, we went to Chengdu and um, this was our scheme. These are the other architects. I think this is Doreen's project. Well, I don't know which one's hers. Um, anyways, we, uh, we got chastised, we got yelled at, we were told uh, these are not uh, Chinese enough. Um, and uh, they said, the client said he wanted to feel that Chinese feeling. Uh, and we said, what does that mean? Um, we're, not, we're not Chinese, we're, we're in Boston, uh, you invited us, and here we are. Um, but none of these guys uh, had the Chinese feeling. So we all got yelled at, we almost got fired. Um, so we went back. Uh, and he said, well, you should visit some Chinese architecture. We went to Suzhou. Uh, and then we went up to the, the Hermes Mountains. We sort of climbed this mountain. It was uh, before sunrise, we climbed this mountain. We were looking out into the fog. Uh, and somewhere up there, there's a Buddha statue. And someone said, that over there, 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 there. That's the Chinese feeling. Um, <laughs> and I said, what? Um, how do I draw that? How do I photograph that? How do I specify that? How do I?" How do I reproduce that? Uh, really sort of difficult uh, task. Um, but we went back and we worked on it and we worked on it and we sort of modified the courtyards, we simplified, uh, and we sort of produced a set of drawings that contained a slight slope roof, uh, a series of windows in a sort of uh, rather opaque wall. Um, and then we sort of detailed it up. We had these kind of small windows with these big surrounds. And we sent off our drawings and we waited. And for nine months, we didn't hear anything. And then we got an email saying, congratulations, the project's moving forward. Uh, we've, we've changed the program. Um, it's no longer a clubhouse. It's now going to be an exhibition hall. Um, and um, the site's changed, too. So we changed the site, and we decided, to, <laughs> we decided to flip the plan around, right? We just mirrored the plan. It's OK, same plan, just mirrored. Um, and so, but it's also, you know, it's also uh, under construction. You know? So we, <laughs> we get these pictures. And we're like, oh, wow. Um, they mirrored our plan. They changed the program. Uh, and they started building it already. So uh, I guess in China, that's quite typical. For us, it was quite shocking. We didn't know what to do. So here was our parcel, site G. Uh, they put it on the new site. Uh, they flipped it around. Um, and then we said, well, maybe give us a couple weeks. We can work it out. So we sort of made it fit better. Um, so I think this is Doreen's building. Right? I think that's it. Anyways, here's our building. Um, still these courtyard houses, still sort of packed together. Um, so the exhibition hall, sure, that works. We can arrange these courtyards. We can provide uh, you know, exhibition space around these courtyards. Um, we, working in Boston, <coughs> coordinate with the local design institute, having to send models, rhino models, coordinating you know, transfer beams. Um, and um, when we went, sure enough, they were building it. And they were building it pretty close, you know. It's not less, it's more, it's like more or less like we drew it, you know. <laughs> it's a little bit there. Uh, they changed a few things, you know. We, you know, we, we wanted, uh, well, we would have liked the brick all to be the same. Uh, we would have liked these textures to continue. But some of them, they got pretty close. Um, the detail that we're most excited about, you know, we like the windows, um, which is what we drew here. Um, but we also like this idea of 
you know, can we go from smooth brick to textured brick? Uh, and the idea of a Chinese brick, which is a kind of local material, uh, how do we think about the brick as having some sort of intelligence? And maybe we could say that the brick is always oriented the same way. So regardless of which orientation the wall is, the brick is always on the cardinal direction. So the concept is a brick with a compass in it, right? And the brick always knows which way it is. And so we did these simple drawings. Uh, so that's the corner I just showed you. It's east-west, you know, cardinal, and then an oblique angle. And so the, the, the east-west is smooth, and the oblique is, is staggered. And here's the same one, east-west, and then oblique. And so that's the sort of the feathering. And so these simple drawings, we had two sheets. We sent it to the client, and they executed. And they said, the rule is so simple, the, the brick layer understands. There's no fancy, uh, you know, um, variations. It's just always keep the brick straight. Um, and so with that simple rule, they sort of executed, you know, straight, oblique, um, and oblique, and oblique. Uh, and so when you walk around the building, uh, you know, in a way, what's east-west, north-south. You also feel like uh, you kind of position yourself relative to the building. So the building has a kind of texture that lets you know when you're sort of off the sort of cardinal directions. And that's a kind of modest move. But in a way, it created a kind of texture, a kind of a vibration, a kind of you know, change your perception of the building, uh, and it helps you sort of locate your building yourself relative to the building. So, uh, and the best thing is the client saw it and said, yeah, that's got some Chinese feeling. So <laughs> we're happy to finally uh, somehow connect. Uh, it was sufficiently Chinese for him, and it was sufficiently contemporary uh, for us. Uh, and so that was a kind of unexpected sort of discovery uh, that we could both satisfy his desire for this Chinese feeling and our desire for something innovative, contemporary, uh, but also kind of unique. We would not have done this if we were working in Boston, uh, and it wouldn't happen if we were working in, in Europe. Uh, so it became highly site-specific. And I think in this kind of age of globalization and global practice, I think how we start to find ways to discover a kind of way of working within particular global contexts, where we can find connections to local materials, local trades, local craft, uh, makes stronger buildings that are somehow more connected to, to the place where they are. Uh, the next project I want to show is also heavily sort of, it's kind of nerding out on tectonics, um, nerding out on structure. Um, so in Boston, at the marathon a few years ago, there was a bomb, uh, there was a kind of terrorist attack, uh, and afterwards a police officer at MIT was killed, and my wife and partner, Meijin, teaches at MIT. Um, and so she was asked to develop a memorial for this police officer. Sean Collier. Um, and we started thinking about what does it mean to, uh, to build a memorial today? What does it mean, you know, do all of our devices allow us to not have to remember anything anymore? Uh, and is, is the signal, you know, sufficient uh, to commemorate or memorialize somebody? Uh, this is a billboard near our office, and after one of these events, I saw that the, that the, the, the MTA was sort of broadcasting these kind of signals about memory and remembrance. Uh, and so we thought about it, and I think MIT expected a new memorial, a memorial that had something more digital or more, more technical, more techy. Uh, at the end of the day, we sort of looked and said, what, what is it about MIT that's special? Uh, MIT's logo is mens et manus, which is hand in mind, which sort of works. MIT is about thinking and doing. Uh, but they also added fortis, which is strength. Uh, and there was all kinds of this you know, MIT strong, Boston strong. Um, and so we said, what does it mean to be strong? Maybe strength isn't just sort of, you know, muscular, but strength could also be um, stable. It could also be equilibrium. You know, how do we think about structure and strength uh, together? This is the site where he was killed. This is the Frank Gehry building. This is the edge of MIT, and this is Cambridge. Uh, and so in this site, we said, what can we do here? The other thing is that everybody had an idea for this memorial. The police officers wanted a flag, they wanted stars and stripes. Family wanted something simple, something about nature. Uh, Sean Collier loved the hiking. He wanted, they wanted a boulder, they wanted a forest, they wanted a water feature. So everybody had something that they wanted. Um, and we said, maybe we can create a figure. And then out of that figure, we're gonna intersect it with a boulder. And then we remove the boulder. You know? So the, the family wanted a boulder. We didn't give them a boulder. We created the absence of a boulder within this other figure. And so when you um, think about it, uh, how do we create a sense of shelter, a sense of place, uh, and produce what we call a conspicuous absence? And so the fact that the police officer is no longer there, 
that his, you know, his presence or his absence is being felt. We thought this structure, in a way, produced that sort of conspicuous void, and you felt that something was sort of radically, radically missing. We also proposed uh, to build it out of solid blocks. Uh, we said, wouldn't it be interesting at MIT, where everyone's talking about innovation and technology, to build something that maybe the Romans would have built, something that was so, uh, in a way, antiquated, you know, solid blocks of stone. In a way, we had forgotten how to build that way because nobody really thinks about solid blocks of stone. Everybody's talking about post-tensioning and cladding and veneer stone. Uh, so this was a kind of radical idea to say, can we build uh, out of solid stone, but can we also use the most cutting edge fabrication techniques available? And so, in a way, the technology is, is Roman, or in terms of setting blocks, or Inca, maybe, uh, but the, the sort of techniques are, are super contemporary. And so this is John Oxenberg, he's a professor at MIT, uh, whose specialization is, is masonry, and he's actually studied uh, vaults and, and arches. And this is uh, Hauke Jungehan from Nippers Helbig from Stuttgart, uh, and Santa Morelli from Suffolk Construction. And so we got this team together, we said we're gonna build it out of solid blocks. We don't know how, but we're gonna figure it out. Because the principle is very basic. It means everything is in compression. There's no tension in the structure. If one block tries to fall. It can't fall because there's two blocks next to it. And those two blocks basically create the kind of transfer of forces. Um, so um, working with our structural engineers, we sort of uh, recognize that it's extremely uh, deflection sensitive. We don't want uh, a block to shift. A shift would produce uh, kind of a potential for collapse. And so the blocks had to fit perfectly. And how do you create a perfect fit? You need to fabricate within uh, an extreme uh, tolerance. So we couldn't have variations more than a fraction of a millimeter. Uh, so this is basically the arching diagram uh, of, you know, the, the keystone would sit here and the adjacent blocks would transfer loads in this sort of load path. And sort of working out the, the load paths, we took uh, some uh, sort of plugins for Rhino, working with John Oxendorf and his team uh, and a bunch of MIT students. We did a, a calculation of the, the mass of the stone uh, the weight of the stone and its thrust, and you can calculate the kind of vectors of the weight of the stone and how does it, how does that vector sort of work its way through the, through the blocks. Uh, and the walls became essentially buttress walls that were resisting. So here's the kind of thrust line in the block, um, and that was important because if that thrust line exits the block, then the block starts to move, and we don't want that. So we designed it with 32 unique block shapes. Uh, each of these buttress walls is proportional to the length of the thrust. And so, in a way, the client, MIT, was excited about a structure that was, in a way, uh, discursive. It's, in a way, showing its, the forces in it. And, you know, anyone who teaches structures knows that you can't see force. Um, yet, force often results in form. And so, how do we think about architecture as form making? And how do we think about architecture as somehow disclosing the forces that are sort of traveling through it? How do we think about that block floating in the air? you know, three and a half tons, and the thrust it creates through the other blocks. Um, we were committed to solid blocks, and so we went to a quarry in Virginia, and we picked blocks. We picked blocks that were large enough uh, to sort of fit within the bounding box of these forms that we'd made. Uh, we went down there with our computers, we picked each block uh, specifically. Some of them were really big, um, and we had to take them uh, to have them fabricated uh, at a facility that could cut these large blocks. Um, and we worked with a company called Quora in Wisconsin uh, who had a completely sort of automated uh, CNC uh, line, so everything was, was carved by uh, computer-controlled fabrication. And we were, I have to say, a bit naive about computer-controlled fabrication. We said, well, we give you the 3D model and we expect it to come back perfect, right? And we know that we can't have more than a millimeter of, of tolerance. Uh, because if the blocks don't fit, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't stand, right? And so we have to have that precision. Uh, it's something that the engineers were very clear about. We don't want any concentrated loads. And so the face-to-face -face, uh, interfaces between blocks had to be perfect. Uh, so some of these blocks were carved continuously for three weeks uh, to remove the material to get that the form just so. The other thing we think about when we think about computer-controlled fabrication, we think, oh, we'll just give it to the robot, right? and the robot will just produce it for us. Um, the fact is, the robot is very smart, but you think you know the size of that blade, right? It's, say it's, uh, you know, one and a half meters. Uh, but as that, that blade is cutting the stone, the stone is wearing, but so the blade is wearing too. And 
So every time this, the blade comes across the stone, the diameter of the blade gets smaller, right? And so we think, oh, the computer knows. Uh, but in fact, uh, we have to think about both the stone and the material of the blade and how the blade diminishes in size. And so we think we're so precise, but we don't know where the edge of that blade is, right? Because the blade is, is also changing uh, over the length of the, of the cut. And so this was something that we didn't realize until we started working with these fabricators and they said, actually, we need to calibrate that saw diameter every time it does a pass. You know, so how do we uh, sort of think about precision? All right, so here we're nerding out about precision and a fraction of a millimeter uh, with a blade that's constantly changing in diameter. That was kind of mind-blowing for us. And so um, here's the robot sort of carving the stone. This is one of the larger pieces of stone. Um, and um, so we started to put it together and we discovered this. This is a duck bank that takes all the power uh, and uh, internet for all of MIT. It just happened to be running through our site. Nobody knew it was there. So we discovered it and thankfully, we're sort of spanning over it. Um, this thrusting um, forces are being uh, transferred back to this gray beam, which is sort of holding everything together sort of underneath. So here are all the pieces. Uh, we picked the stone, we picked the stone with a, with a figure, and so you would see this figure working around the stone. So you would know that it's not just a veneer, it's not just a, a paper thin layer, it's actually volumetric and massive. And you can imagine that vein running through, and you can follow it all the way around and all the way through. So it's a really a three dimensional, it's a three dimensional <coughs> figure. Um, these stones were set. There's the Frank Gehry building. Uh, there's the keystone, K1, it's a five sided stone. Um, five-sided stone has three faces on each side, so there's 15 faces that need to be perfect. Uh, think about the tolerance of that. You don't want a fraction of a millimeter off on these 15 faces that are somehow coming together. I always thought the keystone came last. Turns out the keystone went first, and then we build out from that so that any tolerance that we accumulate actually goes to the edges, and we can adjust the edges if we need to. But it was actually very precisely fabricated, uh, and it actually went together pretty, pretty well. So there's the keystone. Each corner of this keystone was surveyed with a digital surveyor that was on site for the whole process. So every piece of stone was basically floating in space, and every point was set uh, by the digital surveyor. So this is, I think, contemporary construction and questions of precision and geeking out. This is like super geeking out. The winter that we built this, we had about 102 inches of snow. It was the snowiest winter ever recorded in Boston. So we had to make this construction for the anniversary of this, uh, of this event. Um, here's all the scaffolding supporting the stone. Um, and we also installed a series of scales. Um, so under the scaffolding are scales. And so as we loaded the stones on the scaffolding, we could read what the weight was. And so as we lowered the scaffold from the center, we saw that the weight on those scales went down and the weight on all the other scales went up. So it was like, we could see that, that transfer of forces. And this was something that the, the um, students at MIT were very interested in. They were interested in seeing the kind of transfer of force. And uh, what, what we learned was, you know, we developed arching action, right? Because the arch is you know, starting to transfer forces. So here's the team after eight hours of removing scaffolding. And the keystone did not sag, did not creak, it did not break, did not explode. Uh, after eight hours, everyone was delighted that it didn't move at all, that it was actually perfectly uh, still in place. And so all, these, all this arching sort of happened in those joints. And for the first time, we saw the kind of the absent figure of this boulder that we'd created. Uh, so here it is um, today, if you went there at MIT. Uh, you could see these stones and see this incredible uh, shallow arch. It's, it's really kind of um, horizontal, the span is about uh, I think it's about 50 feet across this arch, and it's all compression. There's no tension. Uh, I think we don't see construction that way anymore. We don't see construction being full of only compression. Uh, and when you're underneath there, you, I think you have a really kind of uh, a strong experience. You feel it in your stomach that you're sort of in a space that's somehow unique, that's somehow uh, conspicuous uh, when you walk through there. Um, and here's, so the memorial I think was, was opened, it's, you know, it's for the family, it's for the community, um, but I think different people see different things in it. You know, the police officer might say, well, it kind of looks like a star, it looks like, you know, like the stars and stripes, you know, and you could say, well, I see the missing boulder, um, 
And so I think there's a little bit for everybody. And that's one of the things that we struggle with when we do memorials. It's like, how do you create meaning for different people? Where different people read it differently. And you can never control meaning. Someone says, I, I see a star, I see a hand. You know, is it about the, the MIT hand in mind? Um, and in a way, we have to work in a way that's abstract enough for people to read different things into it. Um, so for us, it was really interesting to sort of work with this sort of idea and then work with experts, engineers, um, stonemasons, fabricators. How do we build something that we, we've never seen before? Um, it's not, uh, not risk-free, but I do think it produces uh, this incredible sort of effect of this sort of the perception of this, uh, the presence of this absence in the center of campus. Um, okay, shifting gears a little bit, still thinking about material, thinking about communication. Um, we were approached by a client who had a view kind of like this, and we said maybe to build a house, maybe we could just sort of preserve that view. So maybe we do a house which is all about seeing that view. Uh, and so um, the house is basically a series of viewfinders looking at the site. Uh, we also thought maybe the, the house could sort of frame a view right through it. And so we created a house that has this sort of window from the front of the yard back through the house and back to this sort of beautiful uh, beautiful view. So there's the kind of plan of the house as you approach, you can look right through. Um, so that's the kind of main living space. Um, and the upstairs is a series of bedrooms that also sort of frame the view. Um, so that's the upper level, sort of looking at, the, looking at the view. We thought it would be interesting to sort of mask the depth of the floor package. Uh, and so we introduced a sort of bevel, uh, which we sort of, um, we detailed out as a sort of um, tapered edge. Uh, and if you look at sort of James Terrell pieces, he always sort of tapers his edges, so you don't know how thick it is. In a way, it dematerializes the wall, because you expect a certain wall to be about this thick. Um, but here, we sort of created this knife edge. And so when you look at the house, you're not sure, is it, is it, is it paper thin? Is it a foot thick? Is it two feet thick? Uh, and so all the edges have this sort of bevel detail. Um, and that's just a little a little twist that sort of, in a way, dematerializes it and sort of asks you to sort of look again. Um, and to some extent, I think the best architecture makes you look again. It creates an attention within a kind of field of distraction. You know, with all of our signals and all of our messages, looking carefully at architecture, I think, is what we're interested in, in asking of our users, of our viewers, of our uh, visitors. Um, in terms of material, we sort of found a guy with a break. This is a break. Uh, and we sort of said, can you do these custom profiles for us? Yes. Uh, so these are kind of uh, interlocking panels. These are kind of uh, shingle type of uh, panels. Uh, and then we had this sort of fancy steel stair in the middle uh, that sort of cantilevers off the edge, sort of creating a sense of, again, kind of lightness or floating. Um, and then these are the kind of metal panels that sort of went on the, went on the house. So here's the view right through the house. I think it's a house that sort of acknowledges that really uh, the house is about looking at, at the landscape um, and not sort of looking at the building itself, but looking through it. Uh, and really thinking about vision and perception in all of these sort of details. Uh, so it really sort of, I think, refines our ability to view and trains us to look carefully, uh, to, look, to look at architecture really carefully. Um, okay, in addition to uh, thinking about stone and aluminum, um, we've also been interested in, in plastic. Um, a few years ago, we were invited to do a, a, a kind of art project, a public art project, uh, and we produced uh, the swing field. We call it swing time. Um, and it's a, a temporary public park in Boston. The client's a convention center, uh, and so they have a parcel that they want to activate. These swings have a little accelerometer, so they're blue when they're still, and they turn pink as they swim. So again, thinking about you know how does technology integrate itself into, uh, into clothing, into um, into landscape and ultimately into these uh, sort of playful objects. Um, so a very simple idea, and we made something that everybody wants to swing on, from uh, kids to grown-ups. Um, a little bit of interactivity, a little bit of responsiveness, and so the sort of color changing is giving you a little bit of feedback. Um, and producing a space um, in the city that's sort of uh, an escape from the city, like the Athens Project. People sort of, uh, sort of immerse themselves in these environments and they sort of forget about the kind of surrounding, surrounding context. Uh, so this project um, we did a few years ago, and then, so how do we do it? We sort of, in our shop, we CNC milled some polypropylene. Uh, we built some microcontrollers. 
uh, program some basic behavior. Uh, this is our studio. This is our shop, sort of fabricating this sort of uh, triangular profile. Uh, it has to be robust enough to carry the weight of a person, but translucent enough to sort of transmit the light and seem, in a way, uh, delicate and, and almost sort of floating. Uh, we did uh, find a company in Boston that could rotomold, and that means that they, they pour the kind of powder in, and they heat it up, and then they sort of twist it. And the surface of the mold is covered with this plastic. And as it cools, it creates a kind of continuous and uh, sort of monolithic piece that's hollow in the middle. Uh, and so working with specialty fabricators, we were able to do these sort of unique molds, uh, which we then sort of tricked out with some LED lighting and some um, sort of um, accelerometer uh, sensing uh, to produce you know, one swing. Uh, and then we, uh, we put on some photovoltaics so that this is essentially off the grid. Um, and people came. They came in huge numbers, and they, you know, they wouldn't get off the swing. So if you went there today and tried to swing, you probably couldn't, because there's so many people that were excited about this, about this uh, uh, project. And they swing in ways that we don't approve of. Um, we had to sort of tell them, you know, yes, you should have fun, but you know, three might be too much. Um, uh, so we made some, some do's and don'ts. Um, again, we think this is good, this is good, this is good. This not so good um, because because we're architects and you know we have insurance and we don't want people to get hurt. Uh, but people were doing crazy stuff. They were swinging like this. They're swinging like this. Um, swinging like this. Uh, and so we you know we collect these images on Instagram uh, because people do crazy stuff. You can't design this. You know people will invent how they use space. Uh, and a little bit of technology sometimes encourages different kinds of behaviors. So we like to think that we can start to anticipate how people will use space. Um, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, Blue Man Group. Uh, Delta Airlines uses our swings for their uh, campaign. So um, we think that designing behavior is actually part of our job. You know, And we can't design it completely, but we can sort of uh, suggest how things might be used. And we're always amused by how people actually misuse our spaces. Okay, the last chapter in the book is called Ecologics. Um, and we've been interested in material, we've been interested in, um, in technology, behavior. How do we think about climate? You know, how, how can we not think about climate? You know, you know this is like Hurricane Michael's coming to, you know, coming to Florida. You have typhoons here, 50 year storm seems to come every couple of years. Uh, and so, how do we think about sort of man-made um, environments um, and the kind of, you know, how robust is that environment? You know, after Hurricane Sandy, you know, Manhattan was wiped out, you know, and it wasn't even a powerful storm. And so, this image that appeared on the cover of New York Magazine, I think for us was kind of like, wow, the city that we think of as so robust and so powerful is actually completely vulnerable. You know, and we're not thinking about uh, our energy infrastructure, we're not thinking about our coastlines, we're not thinking about our public realm in ways that support uh, or mitigate you know, questions of, of climate resiliency. So um, we thought, what can we do as architects? How do we sort of visualize uh, environment? How do we create a kind of eco-literacy? How do we get everybody to sort of see the environment in a very deliberate way? And so. In Massachusetts, there's a big push for wind power, but people are like, oh, wind power is ugly, we don't like it, we don't, you know, so we're ambivalent about wind power. But we thought, maybe wind power is, you know, maybe we should make it beautiful, maybe we should make it legible. Uh, so again, we sort of took to our sort of making. Uh, we sort of bought a few motors, some LEDs. We thought we could design a more beautiful wind turbine. You know, maybe it's not a piece of technology, maybe it's a piece of sculpture. Uh, and we tested it. So this is our roof. You know, we. This is the most beautiful one. Um, but it's not really performing, right? It's not doing what we need it to do. We just need it to light up. I mean, how hard is that? Um, but so this one seemed to work well. Uh, and so we installed, I don't know, 500 of these at MIT. Uh, this is an IMPA building. This building, when it opened, was so embarrassing because the wind loads on the building made it so you couldn't open the doors, right? It was like the wind that made it not function as architecture. and so. How do we use the wind and make the wind visible in this building uh, to sort of let people understand that wind is invisible, but we can make it legible. And if you're, if you're making wind power legible, maybe you're sort of connecting to this question of energy not as an abstraction, 
but as something that can be produced, can it be produced locally. Uh, we think of energy as somehow like from over there. Um, making it site specific, making it visible, is one way to create a kind of eco-literacy that everybody can read their environments. So this is our temporary project for MIT in terms of uh, uh, wind power. Uh, recently, uh, we won a PA award for this project uh, in the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia. Um, so Philadelphia, you may know, uh, is a city on two rivers. It's built on, on trade, you know, not, like, not like Hong Kong. Uh, the waterfront is super important, but the waterfront got extremely polluted. Uh, if you look at Philadelphia, this is the Schuylkill River, this is the Delaware, uh, the, the city built itself between these two rivers. Um, and if you follow the rivers upstream, this is coal country. This is where all the coal came from. So all the coal would come down the river, in Philadelphia, they would sort of process it, they would turn it into energy. Uh, and this is the extraction economy that for 100 years was sort of pulling resources out of this sort of rich landscape and ultimately sort of polluting uh, the city of Philadelphia. The river of Philadelphia actually caught on fire once. It was so polluted, the river caught on fire. So that's something that not too many Philadelphians know. Uh, and actually, the other thing is that the river has been re rehabilitated. It was one of the first Superfund sites. And so they've remediated the river, making it sort of accessible to people. But nobody knows that. Nobody knows that the river's clean, because nobody thinks about it. And so we thought, how do we sort of take this extraction industry and this sort of architectural intervention to make people aware of their environment again? You know, can we create a site from which you would see and perceive the river differently? Uh, and so we invite people in Philadelphia to come back to the river, to observe the river from a different perspective, uh, to have a different view into the river, to verify that, in fact, it's been remediated. In fact, the water's clean. In fact, there are fish in the water. And so uh, not too many Philadelphians know that there's fish in the water. They don't know that it's, that it's not polluted. And so this is proposed as an outdoor classroom, something that we could have events. We could have uh, uh, workshops on water quality, workshops on you know, what kind of animals live there. Uh, and all we have to do is figure out how to make this thing sink into the water, right? Like a submarine. So we're architects. We don't know anything about submarines. Uh, but we can collaborate with a naval architect, with a naval engineer. And so we pitched this idea, this ring, that you can sort of walk down and experience the water from a different level. Um, our naval engineer said, yeah, we can prove it. We can build a mock-up. And so we spent $50,000 to build this mock-up uh, to show that we can sink this into the river by flooding it. Essentially, you're, you're creating a situation where you're capsizing this barge in a very controlled way. So here's the mock-up. Uh, dropped it into the river, filled it with water, um, and proved that we can sink in a very controlled way into the river. So this mock-up, uh, we brought the, uh, the donors on board. They liked it. The William Penn Foundation gave us $2 million uh, to build it. So we're going to build the big ring, uh, not this summer, but next summer. So if you're in Philadelphia, come and see uh, the float lab, which is going to be sinking very slowly uh, in the river, in the Schuylkill River. Um, the last portion of this book is actually called Feed. And we thought, you know, books are sort of artificial. Uh, how do we sort of show that the work is still in progress? How do we sort of show work in progress? How do we show a little bit about the character of the office? Uh, maybe uh, we could sort of show the space of the office and the kind of projects we're working on. Uh, so the last part of the book is kind of like uh, work in progress, uh, things that are still sort of happening, uh, things that are still sort of cooking. Um, the one project that's cooking right now is something we're doing in Chengdu. Um, it's uh, in a place called uh, Lux Lakes. It's a site here called A7. This is like Chinese urbanism, right? It's like a highway subway, and then these sort of really surreal artificial landscapes. Um, and we were like, well, so Chengdu's over there somewhere. Um, and how big is this site? It's about the size of Lower Manhattan. Um, that's being built like that from scratch in the middle of nowhere. So this is like the ambition of like Chinese developers and Chinese <coughs> city planners, making a city from scratch um, in a way connected by infrastructure, importantly. It's not a suburban American city, just about cars. You can get there by subway. Uh, but it's imagining a whole, new, uh, a whole new city, a whole new urban fabric. So um, a number of different architects are working uh, on these uh, parcels. Well, we actually ended up doing Hotel D, 
uh, which is a small sort of boutique hotel. Um, and we also did that one and these other ones. Uh, but for the hotel, we said, how can we create something that's really sculptural? Again, sort of learning from the Collier Memorial. And so how does a memorial inform a hotel? Well, you know, we could make these really dramatic cuts. And this is uh, the lobby floor. Uh, and this is the arrival area. And these are the hotel rooms up here. And so uh, we pitched this idea that we can make the hotel look like a landscape, uh, look like something that's been sort of carved out of a solid block. Uh, and so what do you do? You have to think about it as landscape. You have to think about it as topography, almost like contours. And so as we manipulate the, the ground of this artificial architectural topography, you know, how do we create a roofscape? How do we create these lobby levels? And ultimately, how do we sort of convey uh, how it would be structured? Uh, and so the challenge, of course, is you have this great form. How do you sort of make it sort of imminently buildable? Uh, working in China, again, learning how to communicate with our, uh, our, our partners, our consultants. We, we build these big models uh, that we take. Uh, so we can say, how about that member? Can I delete that one? Yes, no, OK. How about that one? Can I delete that one? So again, trying to figure out how to work uh, in, a global, in a global context. Uh, being able to sort of collaborate and communicate effectively is the only way to sort of realize these projects. Um, so the ground, the lobby level, uh, the kind of spa level, and then the hotel rooms upper level. Um, one of the challenges, of course, is that we want this to read as a solid, but we need to have some windows in there, right? Because no one's going to check into a hotel without windows. Um, so uh, we sort of worked to think about that skin, uh, and how do we sort of treat that skin in a way that allows for views, but also holds the surface. And one of the things about holding a surface is that if it has more thickness, from different views, it appears opaque, right? So on the oblique, it looks quite opaque. Uh, and so we were developing a strategy for sort of thickening the wall uh, with this particular profile that allows us to cut openings through it and preserve views while uh, from oblique angles creating a sense of opacity. And so working with a facade consultant who sort of developed a series of extrusions uh, that are sort of these concavities that we could sort of uh, carve out these uh, elliptical openings in it. Uh, and so working in this mode uh, and trying to create these types of spaces. So this is something that we're currently working on. It's a work in progress, but I think we can still sneak it into the book and show it as a kind of uh, progress uh, a project. Uh, one last project I want to share with you tonight. Um, this is a project also sort of in progress. This is the University of Virginia, um, designed by Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson, American president, also an architect, uh, also a founder of this university. And so for many uh, American campuses, uh, Jefferson's UVA is the kind of quintessential archetypal uh, American campus. The architecture is Palladian, and you know, it's kind of this ideal architecture, it's sort of defining this pure space, uh, and people comment about how, how perfect it is, how harmonious it is. The pavilions are actually um, getting closer together as they get closer to the rotunda, so it creates a sort of forced perspective. Uh, the lawn is actually stepped a few times, and this, this project, in a way, defines what an American university is supposed to look like. Uh, what people don't know is that you know Thomas Jefferson, or maybe they do, Thomas Jefferson owned a bunch of slaves. And slaves built this campus. And slaves operated these buildings. And so what you see here is this pristine view. But one level down is the slaves' quarters. And then one level down further is the yard where the slaves were chopping wood. They were slaughtering animals. They were you know, gardening. They were farming. And so this perfect utopian American campus masks and hides the infrastructure of the slave trade that enabled it. And so students at UVA a couple years ago realized this. They said, why don't we know this history? Why is this history hidden from us? In a way, if you look in this window right here, the sort of presence of slaves was already built into, the, built into this image of this ideal campus, even though the slave was sort of hidden. And so the students at UVA said, we want to acknowledge this. We think this is part of our history. We think it's a kind of it's a, it's an injustice that hasn't been acknowledged. Uh, and so, you know, Thomas Jefferson, if you sort of research what his quote, he says, follow the truth wherever it may take you, you know. And so we were invited to uh, pitch for this project. Uh, we went there and we talked about, you know, Michelle Obama said, you know, I wake up every morning in a house built by slaves. Who knew that the White House was built by slaves? I didn't. That's not part of the history of American uh, architecture or the White House or the kind of narrative of, you know, Washington, D.C. or any of these institutions. So. This is something that's sort of under the surface in American culture, 
Um, Michelle Obama brought it to the surface, UVA brought it to the surface. At the same time, there are these statues all over the country, Confederate generals that are um, being celebrated. And these were not built after the Civil War. These were built in the 1920s, 30s, 40s. Uh, these statues were designed to intimidate you know, black people. And so right now there's a huge debate in the States about what to do with these statues. Some people say this is part of our history. Some people say these are kind of um, you know, uh, 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 structures of hate. Um, and sure enough, there's plenty of people here that want to preserve these memorials, and plenty of people that want to tear them down. So this is a difficult thing. How do we, who do we side with? Do we tear it down? Uh, on the other hand, there's this thought that you can't change history, but you can learn from it. And so how do we sort of put these monuments in a, in a context where we can learn from them and not just erase them? I think there's plenty of lessons to be learned. If you look at you know, Germany's sort of handling of all these different difficult sort of historical moments, uh, not just erasing, but actually putting in different in different context. So this was the, the context in which we interviewed for this project, and to our surprise, we were awarded the project. So uh, part of the award was to do this community engagement. So for six months, we met with the, with the faculty, we met with students, we met with the staff, we met with the, the people in the city, we met with churches, uh, and we developed a series of ideas and said, what do we want from this memorial? Do we want it to be painful? Do we want it to be violent? Do we want it to be representational? Uh, and ultimately, we settled on a site over here. This is the, the, the Jefferson uh, sort of idealized uh, sort of quadrangle with the rotunda. Um, we decided that there are a series of sites around campus that are, you know, this was a slave quarter here. Um, the slaves are working in these gardens. And so all around campus, there are these markers that tell you a story. Uh, but the distributed memorial was somehow insufficient. They felt they needed something really present, something that you could actually have a gathering where people could gather and remember and gather and also celebrate. Because they celebrate the lives of the people that come uh, and work there. And so the subtle gesture is that Jefferson's rotunda is an 80 foot diameter sort of um, a dome. Uh, and we proposed a kind of upside down dome as a kind of bowl shape with the same diameter just off to the side. And so this idea that we could create, in a way, a figure that's like a kind of, a kind of uh, an inclined uh, circle that's inscribing uh, and sort of carving itself into the ground. Um, at the same time, you know, we could use the outer surface to, uh, to carve certain content, and that was something the community really wanted. And also the idea that we could uh, carve in the names of the slaves that work there. Um, the problem is, the slaves, we don't know their names. Uh, there are about 5,000 slaves that work there, but we don't know their names, and we don't have their, their pictures. And so we're working with an artist to sort of create a kind of texture on the exterior that's evocative of the kind of drill marks that you would see on a piece of stone, like these are the kind of marks that the stone makes, but also something that could sort of embed in it a kind of image. Um, we're working with the same stone fabricator to sort of engrave in a way the, the face um, in the stone. And so this is a kind of optical effect that you get when you, when you move around the, the memorial. At the same time, historians are researching you know, what the records were, and slaves were actually property. You know, they weren't human, they were property. And so the records show you know, how many extra hands they hired at Christmas time. You know, uh, is that two, 50? I don't know. But they didn't really have names. There's only about six that have names. The rest were sort of known as like first name no last name, uh, unknown, there's plenty of unknowns. And so intellectually, how do we create a memorial that acknowledges the 5,000 people that may have worked there? Um, by carving something into this space, we're gonna make 5,000 marks, and above those marks, we're gonna carve in the names that we know. And as historians discover new names, because they do, they continue to find new names, we're gonna carve those in on top. Um, so when this project was announced in the Washington Post, uh, people were excited about it. At the same time, there's a bunch of people that sort of gathered around these statues. I don't know if you remember last summer, there was a huge neo-Nazi rally in Charlottesville. These are people that come, uh, they're white supremacists, they're KKK, they're neo-Nazis, and why are they standing in front of Thomas Jefferson's rotunda? Maybe they think that Thomas Jefferson would support them. Maybe they think that Thomas Jefferson's ownership of slaves creates an ambiguous message that, hey, it's okay to have slaves. And maybe this idea of white supremacy is still 
sort of present in the kind of ambivalence that the university has about its history. And so the fact that the neo-Nazis showed up at UVA last summer, and the fact that the university is finally creating a monument to acknowledge the kind of violent institutionalized uh, institution of slavery, we think they're related. And so once the university can sort of come clean and say, we acknowledge this difficult and dirty and unpleasant past, maybe that will sort of, in a way, counteract the sort of ambivalence and the ambiguity around uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's legacy. So maybe in closing, I would say that you know we're interested in how architecture communicates, what kind of signals we can make as architects, how does those signals uh, create a kind of political position, articulate a sense of what does it mean to be in the public realm, how do we use technology, but also that public space matters, that when we design, it matters how we design and what messages we send. So if you're worried about design being too trendy or not being political enough, I would say uh, it certainly does matter. And it's, and it's your job as a designer, as an architect, to sort of put that sort of political position, to advance that sort of project uh, in your designs every day uh, and try to be sort of clear with your kind of signal, even though everything is sort of surrounded by a dense cloud of noise. Okay, thank you.